Okay, here's what happened. I was very happy in practice, loving what I was doing as a chiropractor, and I kept getting distracted by trying to figure out how to manage people because I sucked at it. And I really wanted to be good at it. I really liked the people that were working for me. Little did I know that I had very talented people in the wrong position. So I would hire somebody who told me that they liked spreadsheets to do my billing, even though they were truly a people person and not a numbers person. And I would hire a numbers person to sit at my front desk because the hours fit, or they were the only person that somewhat qualified for the job. And I needed somebody to sit at my front desk because my office was busy. And what ended up happening is I would do, I would make these decisions impulsively to cover my butt so that I could serve all of the people. But what I found is I was just constantly chasing my tail. And what would happen is I would hire these great people. They weren't able to do the job that I wanted them to do because it wasn't the right position for them. I didn't set them up for success. That's the bottom line. And what I, and I'm going to go to what happened. So what happened was the, you know, what hit the fan and I had like a, um, a moment of clarity where I needed to very clearly make a change because I knew that I couldn't keep wasting time and money and energy, not only mine, but the time, energy, and money of the people who were involved in their families and their kids um, in hiring the wrong people for the wrong positions. And when I finally did it wrong one last time, I stopped. I stopped doing it wrong. And I promised myself that I was going to figure out how to do my practice in the way that feels joyful to me without staff present. And I got good at it. And that was the birth of staffless practice. And then the pandemic hit and all my friends were like, hey, Jody, how do you do the thing? And that was the birth of the academy. So fast forward four years and um, the, here's the irony. So the irony is that I recognized very quick that, that Staffless Practice Academy and this group and all of the things that I offer when I go live and I do all the things that I do, I very quickly recognized that I couldn't do all of it. I was doing all of it, but it was during the pandemic. It was when things were on pause. And I was, as life came back, I saw that I it got harder and harder to do all of it. I remember having um, two people on my team at that time, they were both virtual assistants and we all had COVID at the same time. This was in probably fall of, 20, tw fall of 2020. And one of these people still works on my team. And I was just finding myself in the same position. Like this sucks. I'm managing people. I feel like crap. I can't even let myself take time to heal. And I started working with these coaches and they, they basically had like a come to Jesus talk with me. And they said, this is something that is a weak link in your picture because of your story with staffless. And if you want to get, at least this is what I heard, right? <laughs> it's not always the same thing as what was actually said. If you want to get really good and you want to grow this and serve as many practitioners as possible, you're going to have to get really good at managing a team. So I tried for a while to hire a manager and have the manager manage the team so that I didn't have to do it. And that was a mistake because this is my baby and my practice is my baby. And I would never have somebody else raise my kid right? Yes, it takes a village. I recognize that. But my practice needs to be done in the way that I see it being done. It's like, um, I just had a very clear picture of how I wanted the phone answered and what I wanted said to a practice member when they got off the table and came out into the waiting area and how I did recalls. I had such a clear way that I wanted that to be conveyed to the practice member. And 
for some reason, I kept missing the mark on conveying it. So I learned how to hire, train, nurture, um, support, and let go of through the staffless practice movement. That's the irony. And now here we are, and um, we have a couple of full-time team members um, from all over the world, some of whom I've never met in person. We have meetings three times a week over Zoom, and we have 11 people on our team. And two of those people work for my practice, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So I learned a couple of things along the way, and I just want to share my pearls with you, my aha moments with you. Um, I'm also going to say that if you are a club member, if you're a staffless practice club member, next week we're doing our master class on when it's time to hire, how to do it. And I give you the spreadsheets and all of the things, like all the whole kit and caboodle. It's called Team of One. That's what we're going into next week in master class. If you want to get into the club, I'm going to tell you how to do it for free. It's only $89 a month, but I like to give the first month away for free so that you can dive in, get your feet wet. And I'll drop the link in this video and use the promo code SERVE. Okay, so going back to what I learned. I learned that there are a couple of things that you can't teach, no matter how great of a teacher you are. And sometimes this matters and sometimes it doesn't. And part of the art of having the right team, and there is an art to it, is having the right people in the right positions. And if you if you have a position where the cultural understanding of your practice is essential, and my rule of thumb is if the person on your team is client facing, meaning they're touching your clients, they're talking to your clients, they're representing your practice, either in the community or on the phone, whatever it is, they need to understand the culture of your practice. They need to be drinking the Kool-Aid. And if you're a millennial and you don't know what Kool-Aid is, Kool is, let's talk, okay? They need to be drinking the kombucha. <laughs> um, and you can't teach that. Like you can... You can add a class to the training guide, but you can't teach a cultural understanding of why it's imperative to get adjusted. It's an experience. It's a life experience. It's a notch on the belt. And I, what I've learned is that um, true change, meaning having a cultural understanding usually requires change. Um, it either happens with a big boom or it happens over time. It happens in drips, right? Sometimes what will happen is we'll hire somebody for our team that doesn't need the cultural understanding. This just happened. We just hired, I'm going to go into hands and heads in a minute, but we just hired a hands person and she very may well may be a head person, meaning that she may in the next six months really get a deep understanding of the culture of our company and become somebody who is client facing. But we hired her as a hands person, meaning she's somebody who copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. She doesn't have to do such critical thinking to get her job done. It's a lot of box checking. It's not a lot of decisions made by her. It's a lot of following the SOP and doing the thing. That's a hands person. Usually a hands person is paid lower on the totem pole, right? Whereas a mind person is somebody making critical decisions for your practice. And this is somebody who is going, is a new patient advocate or in charge of the recall program or somebody who's going to need to do critical thinking in order to be really good at their job. So in, with my, usually uh, we run a lot of different programs for staffless practice clients. And um, our higher end clients have available to them a program called Team of One. And basically what it looks like is I meet in the Zoom with you and we roll our sleeves up for about an hour. And I ask you 50 questions about what you want this person to do for your practice. Usually the answer to the questions are, the things that you no longer want to do. Like, 
For some reason, I hate taking the trash out and I hate refiling travel cards. Yes, I still use travel cards. Don't, don't get on me about it. Okay. It's a thing. And I just don't like doing those two things. So they would be the first thing on the list for me. Some people, the answer will be, no matter what, I do not want to deal with insurance companies. Like that's where I draw the line. And that would be the thing that we hire for. The thing that we hire for first is the thing, it's the things that you dread because the idea, the bottom line, the foundation is loving being in practice. That's what we want for everybody because if you're loving it, then your clients are loving it and then they're gonna go make the world better and everybody will be better and we'll be doing our job, right? If you're miserable, if you're in practice and you're miserable and you're not loving it, that's what you're spreading. Bottom line, you guys, right? So usually the first job that we talk to our clients about hiring for is what we call a Casper. And if you're over the age of 40, you know what Casper is. Casper was this cartoon when we were kids, Casper the Friendly Ghost. And the idea is that this Casper is a person who sweeps in when you're not at the office, they do not get in your way, and they make the office beautiful after a busy shift. And they take the trash out, they wipe down the tables, they water the plants, they bring the mail in, they sort the mail, they might go to the bank for you. They do all of the busy work that you don't want to do because you want to spend your time in the office serving practice members. And if you don't have staff, this is the best first job to hire for or having somebody to deal with your billing. Those are usually the two most common jobs that we hire for. A Casper is generally a hands person. However, they are a high trust person. So here's how I would go about hiring a Casper. I would definitely do a background check. I would definitely check references. They're going to have the key to my office. So I want to know that they're legit. They're going to need a car or reliable transportation. I need to know they don't necessarily need to be drinking the Kool-Aid of their practice, but it would be nice because energetically they're going to be touching all of the things in the office. And I'd really like somebody who loves what we do to be the one touching all of the things in the office. My Casper in my practice is the first person I hired in years. Um, and she actually used to be one of my front desk people. Her name is Lee and she's very cool. If you're watching this, Lee, you know I love you, girl. Um, I see her maybe once a year, but she's at my office three times a week. That's really how it happens. And I pay her, she does this for other people. So I pay her as an independent contractor, dot your I's and cross your T's on what you're allowed to do and what you should be doing per your attorney. That's really important, you guys. And she has a checklist that she follows and she shops for the office. So she has access to my PayPal account. So all of these things are things that really, it, she needs to be a multitasker. She needs to be reliable. In my world, she needs to be drinking the Kool-Aid. She needs to be consistent. She needs to show up when she says she's going to show up. She needs to respect my space. She, um, she needs to be a good communicator since I'm not seeing her. So these are the cool thing is that these are all things that we can interview for. We can interview for showing up on time. We can interview for consistency. And, it, and it, like an example of interviewing for consistency would be, I'd like for you to text me for the next three days by 3 p.m., three things that you love most about life. And you're looking for three texts, three different days with three different things in them on the answering the questions that, so you're checking for accuracy, you're checking for um, continuation, you're checking for diligence, you're checking to see what kind of writing style she has in a text if she's gonna be texting your practice members. These are all things that you can set when you're figuring out who you want to hire for your practice. What I would do years ago is I would hire that person to do my billing when she really had no place doing billing. She knew nothing about it. She knew as much about billing as I did. And now if I'm going to have somebody do billing for my practice, which I don't even do anymore, 
um, I'd hire a billing company because that's what they do all day long. They could they could run circles around me with billing. Yeah, it might cost a little bit more money, but how much money is it going to save me? How much money am I going to recoup? What I've learned the hard way is that you can't be cheap when you're getting a team together. You just can't be. Um, so that's a Casper. And then the other thing that I see our clients hire for often will be a virtual assistant who does like busy work. So they might create spreadsheets. They might do um, Canva um, Facebook ads. They might do Instagram, handling the Instagram account. And it's very easy now to find independent contractors or freelancers who can do this work from overseas. Everybody has mixed emotions about this and Godspeed, if this is not your jam, I get it, right? But on this side of the computer, if I can hire somebody, a beautiful person who's really talented and super committed to my team and showing up when they say they're going to show up and dotting the I's and crossing the T's for $8 an hour, um, I'm going to lean into that and check it out. I'd be silly not to as a business owner. What, I would never do that, however, for a mind person. I would never, I, I pay my team members very well. And um, these are both my team members for my, I now have two team members for my practice, both part-time, both virtual. And I have um, nine team members that run staffless practice with me. So that's a little bit about putting the right person in the right position. You want to look at what are their skills? What's their experience? Um, what, what do they need? Like, do they need a computer? Do they need reliable transportation? You might have to spell that out in a job description. I know that that seems silly, but you might have to do that. Um, do you want them to be calm and patient and wait for you to finish talking or do you want them to be more aggressive like what's the personality that you want for this role and you guys you want to think of all of this for my club members next week we're going to go into the spreadsheet for all of these pieces like how do you break down the skills the experience the cultural fit the um the education, the what material needs, we're going to go into every one of them. And again, if you want access to the club, drop something below and I'm giving it to you for free for a month. Okay. Um, then we get into how to, so once we hire and we've set up the perfect interview and we'll get into that next week too in the club. Um, how do we ensure that our team members are A, training the way that we want them to train? And B, how do we know that they, yes, they are a fit for our practice? I've developed a training program. It's a weekly meeting. The idea is you have it weekly with your team members or you have it every two weeks, depending on how busy your practice is and how busy their job is. And it's called Five Freedoms. And it's, and we're, again, in, if you're in my club, we're going to go through this next week in masterclass. Um, the five freedoms are, that it sounds like this, okay, gratitude, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that you said yes to this position, and I'm grateful for everything you do for my company. Two, appreciation. I really appreciated when you did this thing. I really appreciated that you showed up 10 minutes early to our meeting and you were ready to rock and roll. So that's, Gratitude, appreciation, acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is, do I have anything to apologize for? Did I screw up in any way over the past week or the past two weeks since we've met last? Um, the third is last week in relation to your job. This is what I promised you I would do. And this week, this is what I'm going to do. That's five freedoms. And both you and your team member have a turn at doing this. Then the idea is that if, if that person pisses you off in front of a practice member, instead of bringing it to their attention right when they do it or embarrassing them in front of somebody, um, you give them the opportunity, you you get the opportunity to be heard during a five freedoms meeting and so do they. Usually if you are playing your cards right, 
there's nothing to acknowledge. There's nothing to apologize for, but sometimes there is. And it's an, it's an understanding that there's space for that to happen. And you guys, if you can't do that, if you can't have space to say, I'm sorry, I screwed up or to allow somebody else to say, it, if that confrontation is too much for you, there's work to be done. You got to double click, right? Boy, oh boy, did I have to. <laughs> so what did I go over? I went over um, when when you when do you know that you need to hire you know that what you need to hire when you're distracted from doing a really good job at what you come to the office to do we don't come to the office to do paperwork we come to the office to serve great care and whatever is getting in your way of serving great care probably time to delegate some things staffless practice does not mean not having staff it means less staff doing work that is not in their lane of genius. It means get Sally out of the position of answering the phone and have her doing your marketing program because that's what she signed up to do when she went and got a master's degree in marketing. She's not the person to answer the phone unless part of what her job on the phone is, is to, uh, is to dance with new practice members. That might be the perfect job for her. I think what I ended up doing too often and you learn from your mistakes, right? I think I ended up putting the wrong people in the wrong position and then putting all these expectations for them to figure it out. Not fair. But I also, in my defense, I never learned how to do this stuff. So the takeaway is if you want to do a deep dive on this content next week in Masterclass, join me in the club. I'm going to drop the link to the club below. Again, it's $89 a month. We meet every week for a live intimate gathering and intimate coaching session you get an entire year of content drip to you to keep you focused on staffless practice um it it's rock solid so and i'm going to give you your first month for free so there's no strings there's nothing you have to lose i don't think i have any questions i hope that that was helpful to you um my hope for you guys is that you learn from my mistakes. And what I've, I think what I've learned most this year as my team grows and, you know, I was talking to one of my buddies last night and really the goal for this year is for my team to continue to grow, but for the quality of what we serve to continue to grow too, so that we're not dropping any balls at all. Right. And, um, I think the key to that is the five freedoms open communication and remembering when I want to make somebody wrong, that if I make them wrong, I'm making the whole team wrong. I want them to win, right? If they're not winning, if I've got my dukes up saying you didn't do this right and you didn't do that right, I'm not supporting them and creating a growth opportunity. The other thing that um, I try to keep on mind is, is every member of my team making my company money? by what they're doing. And if I think about the people who are on my team who are not making the company money, are they in a position to learn how to be better at what they're doing or how to move into a position? Because at the end of the day, I hate to say it, but it is a business. My chiropractic practice is a business. It's a business that serves great care and changes lives, but it is a business, right? I pay taxes. I file my, my reports. I do all of the things just like any business owner does. So whoever is touching my business needs to be helping me grow the business, whether it's energetically or financially or uh, policy wise or the actual practice space, whatever it is. So take a double click, take a good look in. Is every person on the team making the business money? If there's a no there, if this person is not making the business money, is are they making the business another precious commodity, time, energy, money, right? Those are our precious commodities. Are they saving you time, which is making the business money? Are they saving you energy, which is making the business money? Or are they actually bringing in money? Those are the three commodities that you want to always protect, right? So ask yourself, every person on the team, are they making the business money? And if the answer is no to one of them, are they trainable? 
is are they a person that needs needs to move from new patient advocate to maybe a financial assistant? What do they wake up in the middle of the night excited about? Like what's their thing? What's their jam? And are they doing that for your practice? Do they have the opportunity to do that? These are all of the hard questions that we, these are big girl questions, you guys. They're the big girl questions. <laughs> Masterclass, um, somebody's asking as I'm live, what day is, Masterclass is always on Thursdays at one in the club. I teach usually two masterclasses a month and then my team coaches teach another two. Um, like that's another example. And I'm going to finish this example and then log off. One of the things that I do to support my coaches on the staffless practice team is I listen to their coach calls. I listen, I give them feedback, and I could very easily say, this wasn't done right, this isn't good enough, I can't believe you did this, or I can say, I love the way that you did this, and tell me how I can help you see the other side of the coin on this topic so that that coaching experience for our client is even more powerful. I had to learn that, you guys, because I used to throw temper tantrums. It wasn't good. And um, the trickiest thing about it is I really loved these people who were working for me and a temper tantrum with somebody that you love hurts. And I had to say, I'm sorry and clean it up. So with that being said, I wish you a beautiful evening. If you're watching the recording of this, you should see whatever link you need to move to the next step underneath it and um, go make the world better with great care. And I'll see you guys next week.